I'm Kieran Statham. I'm the head at uh, St. Joseph's Catholic High School. And uh, I'm going to be talking you through um, what would be our normal um, assembly that we'd have all year groups. This morning it's on the raising of Lazarus. And then afterwards, I've got a few announcements. Um, both the parents might want to have a look at and certainly some that's more interested for um, for some of the students, more specifically for each year group. I just want to start, start on the theme really for um, the raising of Lazarus because it's a powerful, powerful text um, that speaks to us uh, in uh, more than ever perhaps in today. It's really wordy when you first start looking at it. So I'm just going to pick out some of the things which first of all really struck me when I read this um, uh, over the weekend. First, this uh, incredible um, uh, emphasis here on something which is so relevant to our time. This is a gospel which is raw in emotion. This man, Lazarus, was sick. His appointment was just associated with illness that was almost destined to be his way. And this was someone who Christ dearly loved, but was ill. His sickness is repeated again, which is leading to the man's death. And as if the apostles that were following Christ didn't get it, his dear friend Lazarus of his had died. And when he was asked to go and see him, First of all, when he got there, Mary and Martha, who were his, one of his good friends, simply kind of sort of threw it back at Christ. Just seemed to sort of blame him and said that if you'd been here, he wouldn't have died. My brother, it's personal, it's raw, and it gets even stronger into those emotions. Mary goes to Jesus, not his mother, but the, but the brother of Lazarus and a really good friend of Christ. She throws himself at his feet, throws himself. It's that you see the whole sort of emotion in there. Lord, if you'd been here, my brother wouldn't have died. That's both of the sisters throwing that back at Christ. Christ's response is, is incredible here because you don't often see this in the gospel. When he sees her crying at the sight of her tears, again, that sense of just pure emotion outflowing there, it's with a great distress and a sigh that Christ comes out with. You can see his emotions flying out here. And it says here that it came straight from the heart. And this is from John's gospel, and John's gospel is well known to be sort of very Greek in its thinking, really into its Plato and its Aristotle, but this is straight out of the Old Testament. That notion to the heart there is a notion of that person as just being one. There is no distinction in the Judaic tradition of a difference between the mind and the body. This is purely the whole of him sighing with emotion. And he asks him for where he is. And then there he is weeping for Christ in what is the shortest verse in the Bible that Jesus simply and talks about the love that he had for him. And then when it was put back to him that he might have actually prevented him, Christ still can't even respond to that. He's just so upset about everything. So here you have perhaps one of the most closest human sort of sides of Christ being pushed out here within this gospel. Where we are today with the CV19, this, this speaks to us right where we're at. Rembrandt, I think, captures this emotion beautifully. Coming from a Calvinist time in the 16th century where he was forbidden to sort of draw or paint religious imagery, he painted this picture of Lazarus. If you could get up there closely and see this um, in real life, a figure of Christ there in the back, this is him here, simply weeping with overcome with grief um, and distress. Then I looked back at the text and I looked at the, the opposite side of those sentences. Because there's a rebuttal to how we cope with that. There's no denying it. There's no excusing it. There's no pulling it away. There's no sugarcoating this. What Christ does say throughout this whole text is that this sickness will not be the end of it. There will be, in some way, perhaps beyond our comprehension, simply something better on the other side of it. And this sickness will, in fact, show us more about the glory of God than perhaps we can imagine right now. But it's going to take a leap, a huge leap of faith. And that is going to take a huge commitment on our behalf. At perhaps times when we simply can't see our way through the darkness into that light. But take a look at these words here. This sickness will not end in death, but in God's glory. Down a bit further on, he will rise again at the resurrection. So there's a symbol of hope coming out of this dark time. I am the resurrection and the life, which is the antithesis to death. This time coming in Lent, these are pertinent words for what's going to happen to Christ. Even though he dies, he will live in me. Whoever lives and believes in me will never die. 
then the question mark to us, then the call for commitment. Do you believe it? Do you believe what we're saying? The girls say, yes, they do believe him. And then that's when he's enabled to go on to see what's perhaps beyond this situation. And there's no denying what the grimness of the situation that it's in there. Christ lifting up his, his eyes up to the father, simply said, thank you, an element of gratitude for what's there. I know that you always hear me. Unbind him and let him go free. Lazarus manages to stand up, leave the tomb, walking out, and come back to life. That perhaps once was always forgotten, one that was lost has now been found. It's a powerful, powerful piece of text because it speaks to us that actually sometimes within the grimness of life, that hope rises from the ashes where it may not have been in the past. And where those people thought perhaps in the past that Christ really didn't care about these things, in fact, he answers them. And he answers them with a positive, life-affirming message. Through this darkness, hope rekindles. Important words for our day. When I looked at this, I was perhaps minded to think back to um, uh, uh, an altarpiece um, that was uh, created in possibly 1515 by Matthias Grunfeld. And it's still there in Eisenhower which is uh, a place in um, uh, Alsace in France. And this is an important text. Please put a piece of art. What you see here is, again, that raw emotion, Mary and John to the side, and the sadness of Christ's crucifixion. But the significance of this altarpiece is perhaps that this was actually in a monastery um, in Alsace, uh, run by uh, an order of monks under the, uh, the jurisdiction of St. Anthony. But it was a specific type of hospital that they'd built and attached next to the monastery to which this was actually placed in. That figure of Christ, snarled, twisted, um, contorted, and clearly in agony and pain, actually reflects the nature of the hospital in Eisenhower. Because the, skin, because the hospital was, in fact, a place for skin diseases. When you look at the picture of Christ up close, it kind of echoes the suffering and the agony of those would have been looking at that face to face. There's no sugarcoating this. There's no explaining it away. There's no saying it's okay, it's going to be all right. It's saying this is where we're at and this is our reality. And people just took that and in a strange way took comfort from that, knowing that Christ was perhaps within their presence more so than they'd realised. Grim, lifelike, no sugarcoating, this is where we're at. This is what the people would have seen. But on the other side of this altarpiece, they would have seen something perhaps more life-affirming than what was very much in line with the gospel that we see on the other half. Because the image of the resurrection and that perfect body, the hope of the life of the world to come, through the meaning of that experience, perhaps, that there is hope on the other side, that through the resurrection, all will be with God in the end. Just to bring this all together, perhaps some of the things we need to take away from this gospel, that sometimes in our lives we feel the absence of Christ. You sometimes think that perhaps Christ didn't care for his friends or those that he actually purported to love. But what happens is that once called upon, Jesus saves Lazarus. And Christ's message is clear to us all. Call upon him and he'll be with us. Maybe not in the way that we thought as young children, but he is there in the midst of us in all of what's going on. And it also uncovers all those anxieties around a time when we're living in a time of sickness, the anxiety, the illness, and the deaths that are coming through. And it shows really how vulnerable we are to all those things that are currently sort of preoccupying our lives, but actually are so superfluous to what really matters. It's made me really think over the last couple of weeks about what it is that's really important, what really nourishes our lives. And perhaps looking back at all those adverts that we used to watch a couple of months ago, how shallow those might be, <laughs> things that tell us that they're the things that are actually going to save us at these moments. But they actually prove incapable of putting us in touch with our roots, in touch with those things and those people that are truly interwoven to the fabric of our lives and that we depend upon, and those things that keep the memory of those who've gone before us. But most importantly, I think this is, it challenges us to call upon Christ, not just at those times when we're in crisis, but perhaps in a way that we should change our lives to what's really important. This is the message of Lent. This is the message of Easter to change our lives now back to him so that we can be at one with him and then be at one with our community.
to realize that things that we sometimes take for granted and leave in the background are perhaps the most important things of all. Jobs done by doctors, jobs done by nurses, those by caregivers, those by the cleaners that we have, those that are the government employees, the providers of transport, the law, and all those volunteers that selflessly put themselves out, out on the edge, day in, day out. Seen from that perspective, perhaps something echoed um, by the great writer who wrote uh, a famous book, um, his Russian experience of being cast out of Russian society and put into the Siberian gulags. In his books, The Gulag Archipelago, Alexandra Sochnitsyn, who wrote in his reflections of hardship and pain and suffering, being put into prison unjustly. Bless you, prison. Bless you for being in my life. For there, lying upon the rotten prison straw, I came to realize that the object of life is not prosperity as we're made to believe, but in the maturing of our souls. For our prayer this week, Lord Jesus, we pray this week with heavy hearts, full of anxiety at the current situation of our town, our city, our country and our world. Help us to take comfort from your words this week, knowing that you too felt grief and loss and experienced times when you needed God to help you. In this time of uncertainty, let me look to you and your example of unwavering faith and trust in God's great, faithful, unshakable love for each one of us. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Saint Joseph, pray for us. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Just want to move on to um, a couple of announcements for this week. These are the big ones. Um, as you'll be aware, the school's closed now until after Easter. Um, we've had to leave the school for a week uh, while we've um, let any traces of the virus that may have been there. And it was only a possibility that it would have been there to let that die. And our cleaners are moving in um, from this morning. It's going to take about two weeks to do a complete deep clean of the school. That means that every surface will be wiped down, and disinfected. All the corridors will be done down. Everything will be completely uh, cleaned by the time two weeks comes to its end, which will be at the beginning of Easter. Um, at that point, we'll contact those who signed up for uh, the key worker uh, places at the school. But what I would say about this is that those positions there um, are just for those people really who simply cannot look after their children during the school day, those that are so vulnerable to that situation. And um, the government's made it really, really clear we shouldn't be contaminating ourselves. We should get into a position where we might be able to spread the virus um, but we will revise what we're doing and we will do that. Um, GCSE and A-level grades, um, we've deliberately tried to keep a low key on this because uh, information hard and fast about what's really happening has been very vague at the minute and nothing's really been settled. But that said, we suspect that um, the A-level grades announcements about how they're going to make them and the GCSEs will come out in the next few days. As soon as we find out about what they are then and how those assessments will be made, and um, we'll be contacting you and um, swing into action about how we actually go around that. Um, uh, just a couple of messages to, to, to all students, particularly at Key Stage 3. Um, we're on Doddle at the minute for Key Stage 3 in particular. Um, we'd love to know how it's going from your perspective and from yours. So get in contact. Um, let us know how it's going. Uh, do get in contact with your subject tutors over email. Um, what I would say is keep a routine. Um, it's easy in these days um, to sort of lose track of the hours and the days. Get up in the morning, get washed, make sure that you're doing that anyway, and try and follow, try and follow the school day as far as you possibly can. Um, the year 13 students particularly are working a lot on live lessons through Microsoft Teams, uh, and I know some other classes are doing that in a minute. Do let us know how that's working and how that's working. Um, um, we're opening up, as you can see this morning, our YouTube channel. Um, we'll have other lessons going out that this going out on that as well. Our year group. Uh, heads of year are um, already putting out their assemblies. Do log in and do look at it. Do let us know by email how that's working and how perhaps we can make it better. We're not the generation that operate TikTok. Um, you guys perhaps are into that. We could do with your advice on that. But keep up all the good work and keep up all the work you're doing because there's a phenomenal amount of work um, that's out there. Um, we've sent out to you to that end um, a number of PDF books. Um, is our has got three going out this week and they are absolutely fantastic. Um, I would say to you um, in this period of time, it's a great opportunity to get up and read. Please, please, please read, 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 read. Read to escape, read to know that you're not alone, read to find out new ideas, read to dream and dream big, read 
to gain courage in the situation that we're in at the minute. Read to learn to write well. Read to understand what tolerance is. Read to understand what love is. And read to be inspired and to change the world. The book that I'm looking forward to um, at the moment reading uh, is this one. It's for economics. Um, this is one recommended by Miss Arif. Um, and it's one that challenges the conventions about how people think about how these things work at the time. I'm looking forward to reading that. It will be a, a good book in that sense. I can't wait for that uh, moving in there. Just moving back to uh, where we're at. Um, I would say there are some amazing things out there on the internet to get out there and discover. Um, I'll put these up here so you can have a quick look at these. Um, but in the meantime, just have a quick look at what you can get out there and discover. Um, I wouldn't be a good Catholic head, would I? And as I said, go and visit the Sistine Chapel. You can see the, uh, the, the uh, website address up here. But just check this out. Um, a friend of mine said this was actually better than going to the Sistine Chapel themselves. Look at this. Move it in. Move yourself into it. Um, and then start having a good look around. No security guards there to push you around. No tourists all around to have a look at, to push you about. <laughs> Have a good look at the side. Those of you that are doing a GCSE um, RE will know all about the top of this um, because you'll be studying that. And this is a great opportunity to do a 360 virtual uh, degree. It is quite literally like being in the private chambers of the Pope um, himself from there. Um, the second museum I'd say get in there and have a look at is the, uh, um, the British Museum. This is a phenomenal website and it will take you to where you kind of need to be. Just take a look at the sort of stuff that you can have a look in here. This sort of stuff here will actually bring you in um, and explain the history of the world by explaining it, by exploring, uh, by taking a few objects and then explaining the history behind it. Well worth getting involved in with that one. Um, the Uffizi Galleries are in Florence in Italy and there's an exhibition out there at the minute called On Being Present. It is well worth looking at. Um, this is uh, all about um, uh, presence in the world, I'll leave it there for you to have a look at. But just bear in mind, the Uffizi is probably one of the best um, you're ever likely to see um, with the world's best art in it. More contemporary is the Friedman Gallery. Um, at the minute, Jan Tichy, who herself worked for the NHS, um, uh, so her art, very modern art that she's got here um, moving forward is more relevant perhaps than our other time, well worth looking at. And then for those who are into their fabrics, at the Victoria and Albert Museum have got a superb exhibition on at the minute on Indian textiles, on their nature and on their making. And it is gorgeous. Um, it will take you through how things are, the beauties of these fabrics, the way they're made, um, and well worth a quick look at from those in that side from there. Um, we are, as a school, uh, signing up to uh, the National Theatre um, and they have access to all of their work coming through in terms of videos, uh, which would be particularly useful for drama, English literature and English language. Um, more of that as and when it comes from there. Um, just in terms of, um, just I would say year 11s and year 13, you guys need to keep a routine as well. Your year is not over yet. Um, it's highly likely that when the GCSE grades are called for, um, and we're asked to submit grades for you that will be moderated. Most schools are, they'll be looking for schools at the top of their game, they'll be looking at schools who are sort of on average, and they'll be looking for schools who are down the bottom. They'll look for a complete sort of overview to look at that. And then what will happen, I suspect, is that they'll get hold of the exam boards and ask exam boards to moderate and check that the grades that are being submitted are accurate. It's what happens every single year. I can't imagine it won't happen from here. It would be really helpful if when we open up again, some way or shape or form, and we'll let you know perhaps how this could happen on a little bit easier sessions, get hold of all your notebooks, bring them all together and any other revision notes that you may have made together um, so that if we're moderated, it really shows just how good your work is. It also really helps us, um, particularly if you're in one of those situations where um, you could be on the cusp of either a grade four or a grade five or a grade seven or a grade eight, or a grade two or a grade three, it will make life much easier for us and we can justify putting that result to be where it ought to be. Um, and I would say um, to all of you year 11 students out there, 
get ahead um, for your reading in your chosen subjects for year 12 as well and for your A-levels. This is a really good uh, example, a really good time to get involved with that. Um, if you log on to our website and look at our prospectus for the sixth form, um, it will look like this. Um, and then if you go to those subjects where there's really great explanations of exactly how it works, what's going to happen, and what we expect of you, but look particularly at your subjects. And when you get onto them and look into each one, you'll find uh, not only a description of what you're going to be doing, but also on this section down the bottom here, if you're going to take that course, what you should be reading in advance. And that's in there for every single subject. These are the things which you want to get ahead of now, get your reading done, so that when you come back in year 12, you haven't stopped reading. You're really on top of it and you can make a flying start. The statistics are by educational psychologists. That if you stop doing maths over a six week period of the summer holiday, you could actually go back in terms of your academic progress of one year. It could be a long time before you're back before September. You want to keep on top of it. So do look through that prospectus. You'll find that under the sixth form where it talks about applying to you. Do take a good, good long look at that and keep up to speed. That's it. That's all for me for the moment. Um, uh, I hope uh, I hope this has been uh, useful for you. And um, we'll clock in at least once a week, uh, probably at the beginning of each week. Um, do log in, see some lessons online. Do bear with us as we start what's a rough and ready uh, YouTube channel uh, so that we can get going. I wish you all the best. God bless. St. Joseph's. Pray for us.